today, I want to talk about men, husbands, and fathers. And uh, some of you know this. Uh, I, I, I would just keep on preaching on something else, but uh, my, my staff reminded me that I need to do a special Father's Day message. And, and whenever they talk to me about a special message, I remember 2002, Mother's Day. Some of you remember, I preached on, is Allah the God of the Bible? And by the way, the answer is no. But my mother was there. And, and I had, she, she, I mean, she liked to tear me apart. <laughs> and then like, on Mother's Day, you preach on mothers. On Father's Day, you preach on fathers. So here we go, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> so Genesis 18. Well, really, to get to Genesis 18, we got to go to Genesis 3. God gives Adam and Eve dominion. The Bible says God put all things under their feet. He gave them dominion. They, they bowed their knee to God's enemy, we could say, Satan. And what happened was Satan used that as entry into the world and literally took their authority. And God was looking at the world from the outside, looking in. And he came and he found a man by the name of Abram and made a covenant with him that he would bless him, that he'd make him great, that he'd make him a great nation, and that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. In other words, the Messiah was going to come through his seed. And God is later talking to Abraham in Genesis 18. And by the way, that is the reason that the Bible is really, it, it is the story of redemption, but it's the story of how God made a covenant with a man named Abraham and how that covenant plays out. Um, that's why the Bible doesn't talk about Dutch people or Japanese people, all right? Because God didn't make a covenant with a Dutch man or a Japanese man. He made a covenant with a man named Abraham who fathered a nation that is the Jewish nation, right? And so by, the Bible is playing this story out, showing us what happens. And by the way, in him, all the families, the Dutch, the Africans, the Japanese, the Chinese, all the families of the earth are affected. They're all blessed. But God said in Genesis 18, 19, for I know him in order that he will command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. In other words, the things that God had spoken to Abraham, they were dependent on what Abraham did. And he said, so that I can bring to Abraham what I've spoken to him. God wanted to do things, but Abraham needed to do some things so that God could do some things. He said, that he's going to command his children and his household after him. Now, n notice the after him part. In other words, he's saying Abraham is going to be an example to his family. Abraham is going to live the way that he needs to live. In fact, in Deuteronomy 6, where God talks about passing your faith to your children. And by the way, that is, that is the number one purpose of parenthood is to pass your faith to your children. Right? And when God talks about it, the first thing he says, the things I command you today must be in your heart, and then you'll teach them to your children. Where do they start? They start in you. So he's going to command his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. That was his priority. Now, biblically, the father is the head of the home. The father's the head of the home. Now, listen, you can be a male, but not be a man. You can be married, but not be a husband. 
You can be a breeder and not a father. Hey, lust shows up with a condom and love shows up with a ring. All right? You know, the man's responsibility is to love and to lead. 40% of children born today in this nation are born to a single mother. Father's not there. He's not loving. He's not leading, which are the, the number one responsibilities for a man. You know, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you don't have many fathers. You know, there is such a spiritual attack on fatherhood today in our nation. You know, a father needs to be present. He needs to provide. He needs to lead. And he needs to guide. And when that's not there, Literally, we are taking the responsibility that God has given us as fathers to our children, and to our family, and we're abandoning it. In 1 Timothy 5 and 8, it says, if anyone doesn't provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he's denied the faith, and he's worse than an infidel. You know, when you don't provide, when you don't guide, when you don't lead, when you're not present, you're denying the faith. The number one thing that a, that a father is supposed to do is to have a faith on the inside that they pass on to their children. And if you're not doing it, literally, you might think that you're, you're in good shape spiritually, but your spiritual life is warped. Right? Listen, spirituality begins at home. And this is the quietest Presbyterian church I think I've ever preached in. <laughs> Listen to Exodus chapter 4. Now God has sent Moses to deliver the people of Israel. Now listen to this. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Did you know that was in the Bible? He's on his way to Egypt to deliver the Israelites and God met him at the camp and sought to kill him. And you say, why? Well, then it says, and Zipporah, which is his wife, took a sharp stone and cut the foreskins of her son and cast them at Moses' feet and said, surely you're a husband of blood to me. So he, God, let him go. Now, here's what Moses is doing. He's going to deliver God's covenant people, but he hasn't brought his own family into the covenant. The mark of the covenant was circumcision. And God says, you go deliver my covenant people, and he's going, but it's not working at home. He's got to get it right at home first. In Psalms 101, it says this, I will try to walk a blameless path, but how I need your help, especially in my own home where I long to act as I should. How many men will say, I need God's help? I'll put both hands up. Keep going. I need, God, I need God's help. See, we, we can think that, that spirituality is something that happens outside of the home, but it needs to start in the home. That's where the foundation is, right? And, and I want to just, just take a moment, and uh, I know there are so many single mothers, and this is in no way to say to you that there is no hope for you. Right? In 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul has uh, taken Timothy when he's just a young guy, probably 16 years old, 15, and he's traveled with Timothy. No, excuse me, Timothy has traveled with Paul, and now Paul has left him, and he's pastoring a church in Ephesus, and Paul writes him back and says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Now, in Timothy's life, the, the, the father figure that should have been there was not there. And Paul stepped in and moved into that position and, and had the male influence in his life. But notice that he said, the faith that's in you was first in your grandmother, Lois, and then in your mother, Eunice, and now I am persuaded is also in you. So if you're a single mother, I just want you to know you can pass your faith on to your children. 
and they can do great things in the Lord. But a, a father needs to influence in the right way. It said, God said about Abraham that he'll command his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Now, men, I like sports as much as anybody. Right? Uh, I, I love to hunt. I love to fish. And I know some of you guys, you're into golf and basketball and baseball and all of that stuff. That is great, right? And it's great that you do those things, right? But the number one thing that you need to do is you need to influence your family in the way of the Lord. That's the number one thing. You need to seek first the kingdom of God in His righteousness, right? And what you're teaching your children, if you put those things above God, right, what you're teaching your children is that is more important than the kingdom of God. That's more important than worshiping God. That's more important than putting God first. Right? And what, what, as my wife has said so many times, she says, your compromises become your children's norms. Your compromises become your children's norms. Right? And every home needs a father to be, a spirit, to be spiritual, to be a protector, right? one that prays, one that reads their Bible, one that God, puts God first, one that worships, one that's blessing their family. I love what it says about King David. He had worshiped, they had brought the ark of the Lord to Jerusalem, and David had set up a tent, and they put it in the tent, and all the Levites were, were there. In fact, it was the one place where anyone could walk into the presence of God. And after David did that, he worshiped, and then it says he went home to bless his house. Right? What did he do? He worshiped, and then he went home to bless his house. Not he went golfing and went home to bless his house. Not he went hunting and went home to bless his house. Right? He, he connected with God. He put God's way first. Then he went home to bless his house. Right? And, and as a father, please speak positive, future-oriented words over your children. Tell them you're going to be great. You're an overcomer. Right? You've got a great heart. You know, God has gifted you. You know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way you should go. And the Amplified says, in keeping with their individual gift or bent. All right? And then when they're old, they won't depart from it. But how many of you realize every one of your children is different? Right? Each one has a different gift or a different bent. And as parents, we're supposed to discern what that is. And then we're supposed to help them move in that direction. That's why you love every child the same, but you treat every child different. You can't do the same thing with, a, with, a, with every child because their bent, their interests, their gifts are different. Right? When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, as he comes up out of the water, the Bible says, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's three things right there that every child needs from their parent, from their father particularly. It says my. They need relationship. They need relationship with you. Beloved, they need your love. They need your affection. And then it says, in whom I am well pleased. And they need your affirmation. They need relationship. They need your love and affection. And they need your affirmation. And that is particularly true when it comes to young men. They need the affirmation of their father. Uh, Really, young men, you know, little boys, little, bo little boys are just little men. In fact, I like to say it this way, uh, big men are just little boys in big bodies. <laughs> huh? Now, what the Bible actually tells us is that the number one need of a man is affirmation. That's his number one need, honor, affirmation. When, when men were, were given a questionnaire and said, would you rather be loved or respected? 
over 90% of the men said, I want to be respected. I could live without love, but I couldn't live without that, that affirmation that I need that someone is proud of me, that someone respects me. You know? And little boys need that. I, I remember as our, our kids were, were growing up, uh, Jeannie became frustrated with our, with our boys. And, and they weren't all that old. And, uh, and she says, I just don't get it. You know, I try to tell them what to do, and they just get frustrated like all get out. And I said, well, what you do is you don't tell them what you want done. You tell them what you want done, and then you tell them how you want it done. I said, and what you need to do is just tell them what you want done and let them figure it out and then tell them how proud you are of them. And when she began to change what she was doing that way, it made a tremendous, tremendous difference in our family in the way that the boys responded to her. Because they're just little men, and they're, they're looking for someone to be proud of them. Right? Now, <clears throat> talking about blessing, uh, the first time I went to Israel was 35, 36 years ago. And uh, we spent, as we do now every time that we go, we, we spent a Shabbat, a, a Friday night meal with the Jewish family. And, and it had such an impact on me. The one part that had the most impact was after we had eaten the meal, every one of the children lined up and got right next to their father. The, the younger one sat on his lap. The older ones actually knelt down. And he put his hands on them and spoke a blessing over each one of them. How many remember the Bible says that Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. Don't forbid them. It says he laid their, his hands on them and he blessed them. Do you know that the doctrine of laying on of hands is mentioned as a fundamental doctrine of Christianity in Hebrews chapter 6? That as parents, we really should be laying our hands on our children and speaking words of affirmation and blessing over them. Uh, Dr. Dobson said this, for every statement of correction that we make to our children or negative statement, he said, we need to have seven positive ones. Seven positive statements for every negative statement. Right? You, the, the things they should never hear, you know, you can't do anything right. You know, one day you are going to end up in prison. You are such a jerk. You know, I read a while back that 90% of people in prison were told by their parents they're going to end up there. I mean, it just, it just shook me to my core. You know, your words have a tremendous amount of power. Instead, you should be saying, you know, God has great plans for you. You know, I think you're great. I, I really appreciate the way that you do this. And I'm so proud of the effort that you put into something, you know. You need to, you know, literally, you're speaking positive words and you're blessing them. It builds their self-esteem. And, and be, as parents, be pliable, especially as men. Uh, I, I know Jeannie's pretty pliable. I tend to be a little more rigid. Um, I, I remember when I was growing up and I misbehaved and my mother get punished me, it was no big deal. But when she said, when your dad gets home, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we were waiting for dad. That is not, that just was not good, right? But be pliable and don't be rigid. You know, give your children room to grow. Give them that room. You know, and the better your relationship with your children, the fewer rules that you need. And the worse re the relationship is, the more rules you're going to end up having. You know, in Ephesians 4 and 6, it says, you fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. It says, don't provoke them to wrath. Right? Literally, what happens is that you provoke them to wrath, and it, it equals rebellion. That's what's happening. They begin to rebel. And it says, don't do it. And there's really four main areas where we as parents tend to fail when it comes to this. The first one is simply punishing in anger. Punishing in, in anger. You know, you don't want to punish your children. You want to correct them. In fact, it, it, the, the word that the Bible uses is discipline. 
right? You're discipling them. It's not because you're mad. It's because you want to correct them and you want to disciple them in the way that they should go. You should never, never strike a child in anger, ever. Second thing is we don't release our children. We, we have a 16-year-old that we're treating like an 8-year-old, and we don't give them the responsibility that they need. See, the, ideally, listen, listen, you parents, listen to me. Ideally, your kids are going to grow up, and they're going to leave. <laughs> Woo! Before they're 28. <laughs> They're going to grow up and they're going to leave. But for that to happen, they need to have more and more responsibility as they grow up. And, and, and some parents, they're like helicopter parents, they call them. You know, they're, just, they're just hovering over everything that their children are doing, and they're not releasing them, giving them more and more trust and more and more responsibility. The third thing is comparison. Boy, I sure wish you were more like your sister. Can't you be more like him? Can't you be more like her? Right? No, you, there, there should never be comparison in that way. Right? And then fourthly is being a hypocrite, saying one thing but not doing it. Saying one thing, doing something else. Those are the things that literally provoke a child and cause rebellion in a child's heart. And again, in Deuteronomy 6, as God is talking to parents, he says, the words that I command you today shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Right? And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be frontless before your eyes, and you'll write them on your refrigerator in the mirror in the bathroom. Oh, Doorposts and gates of your house. At our house, that's the mirror, that's the refrigerator, that's every place that we look. Right? So as a parent, right, it's got to be in your heart, then you teach them diligently. Now, one of the, the mistakes particularly today, that we see is that what parents often want to do is they want to be a friend to their kids, right, and not a father or a mother and not a parent, right? Now, if you will parent them properly, when they get older, they'll be your friends. But when they're 13, they don't need you to be their friend. They need you to be their parent. They need you to make some decisions they need you to lay down, like it said, God said about, about Abraham, that he commands his children and his household after him. Right? There is a time when they're older, they will be your friends. But as they're growing up, you need to be their parent, and you need to have God's word in your heart. You need to teach it diligently to them. You need to be an example, and you need to set, give them morals and give them spiritual boundaries. Right? That is so necessary. Right? And then don't nag over minor issues. Right? And as I mentioned before, don't put anything else before the kingdom of God. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And like David, he worshiped and then he went to bless his house. Right? And we need God's blessing. We need to, it, we need God's blessing in our families. We need it in our jobs. We need it in our relationship. We need it at school. We need it at work. We need it facing obstacles and problems. We need the blessing of God, right? And we need to acknowledge it. Now, when Joshua was 110 years old, he followed Moses to become the leader of Israel. And it says when he was 110 years old, this is what he said. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, now, you, what culture's doing may be something different. What your friends are doing may be something different. What the neighbors are doing may be something different. But he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And listen, you and I, we are in a spiritual battle, and we need to fight for our family. And we need to do what's right. We need to put God first, put the kingdom first, and have that in our heart and model it, right? Be a good role model putting God first in every area of your life. <laughs> love your children, love your family, enjoy them, but put God first, right? God first. Uh, 
as the spiritual head in your home, man, you have a tremendous amount of authority that you probably don't even realize. In, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Three of his disciples are with him, and he's left nine disciples behind. And there is a man who brings his son to Jesus' disciples that are left behind. And they were unable to bring a healing or a cure in that young man's life. And then the, young, the man sees Jesus as he comes. And uh, he says, Jesus, I brought my, my son to your disciples. And they, they couldn't help him. And uh, Jesus asked the man, well, what's the problem? And he says, how long has this been going on? Well, he says, he often throws him both in the fire and the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What Jesus said to this father was, look, you have spiritual authority in your home. You've got authority in your home. We call it relational authority. You know, the closer that person is to you, the more spiritual authority that you have. Right? It'd be one thing with my wife and my children. It would be something else with my sister and then another level with a niece or a nephew. Right? But the closer you are, the more relational authority is there. I remember years ago, and, and Jeannie could probably come up and tell this story better than I could tell it, but our kids were sick. I came home, and the kids were... They were in bed, and they'd been in bed all day, and Jeannie had been trying to be a mother and take care of everything, and, and, and I came in, and she said to me, she met me there, she said, this is your house. How long are you going to put up with this? Now, I'm sure she didn't say it with quite that tone, but that's sure what it felt like. <laughs> How many of you men know what I'm talking about? She can whisper, and it sounds like she's shouting. All right. It's kind of like, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going up there, you know. <laughs> I went up there, laid hands. One of them kids prayed for them in Jesus' name. In 15 minutes, they were fighting. <laughs> it was normal. That's what I'm trying to say. It was normal. <laughs> you know? Sometimes we, did, we need to take and use that authority that God has given us. And, and, and our culture has such a strange picture of what a real man is. Let me just tell you, Jesus was a real man. He was not a John Wayne, macho, don't need any help, won't ask anything. Now, he, he, that was not the type of man that he was. But you know, he had compassion on the sick, empathy for the hungry. Right? When, when Lazarus was dead and he saw the sorrow, the Bible says he cried. Now, he was not the, what we would call a John Wayne, macho guy, but he was a real man. And a real man knows that he doesn't know everything. Look what it says in Proverbs 20. It says, counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. What it's simply saying is this. When somebody knows something, he said, it's like deep water down on the inside. He said, but what you need to do is you need to draw it out. You know how you draw it out? You ask some questions. See, we, we all, uh, as macho men, we want to know everything. You, you, listen, you, you don't know 1% of what you need to know. Right? And you need to ask some questions. I remember when, when Jeannie and I lived in Mexico, this was just a cultural thing. Right? But nobody wanted to admit they were ignorant. They didn't know something. So they would always tell you something. And we found out in a hurry that it was not just safe just to ask anybody anything. We were looking for the hardware store. And so I asked somebody where the hardware store was. They told me, go three blocks, turn right, and it's right there on the left. We went, it wasn't anywhere around. So we asked somebody else, and they told us to give us different directions. We went there, it wasn't anywhere around. We asked somebody else for directions, they gave us directions, we went there, and it wasn't anywhere around. They just wouldn't admit they didn't know, so they'd just tell you something. You know what? A lot of men are like that. They just want to act like they know everything. Look, you don't. You don't. And don't be afraid to ask questions. All right? And don't think you can go it alone. I'm, I'm going to close with this. Uh, 
Every one of us have great days. Right? And every one of us has strengths, and, and we've got times when we can handle what's ever coming. Right? But there's times when you simply need help. I remember David, that he killed a giant named Goliath. Anybody? Wave at me if you remember that story. All right. Okay. Now, how many of you remember the giant that David could not kill? One, two, three, four, four. Listen to this. Then Ishbibinab, who was one of the, science, the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abisai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. And then David's men said swore to him, saying, you'll not go out to battle with us anymore. The other place where this same story is told, it says, and David became weary. David became weary, and the giant would have killed him. But Abishai came and helped him. You, know, you need to have some good faith friends. You need to have some people that you can pray with. You need to have some people that you can talk to. And don't think being a macho man means you're going to go it all alone because there's going to be days you can kill Goliath, but there's going to be an Ishbibinab that shows up. And every one of us needs some good friends. Somebody who can help us when we're fighting battles. Somebody who can pray with us. Somebody who can give us the word of the Lord. And don't think, well, I've just got it all together. Because there are good days when you do, but there's going to be days and there's going to be battles and there's going to be giants where every one of us is going to need some help. And don't try to be John Wayne. Because you're not and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Right? But have the relationships that you need where you can go and say, hey, pray with me, stand with me, give me some wisdom, help me out. All right, would you bow your heads, please? Father, first, I, I just thank you for every man, every father that's here. Lord, I ask you to bless them with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you will fulfill or grant all of their requests and that you will fulfill all of their purpose. Lord, we just bless them in the name of Jesus. But as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, God is a father. And he loves you. In fact, there is nothing you could do that would cause God to stop loving you. And you may not know this, but he is love. And because he is love, there's nothing you could do that would make him love you more. And what he wants to do today is to reach down into your, your life and your heart. If you're away from him, and he wants to bring you home. He wants to affirm you and love you. And there is no valley so low or sin so shocking. No sex so perverted relationship so appalling, pit so deep, or life so empty that the blood of Jesus cannot reach down and cleanse you, lift you up, and make you whole. And if you're here today and you say, I want God to come. I want him to make me new. I want him to forgive me. You say, I, I just feel so far away and I'm so far gone, but God specializes as impossibilities. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there's many mansions. And I want you to know that in the Father's house, there's a place for you. That just like the prodigal son, when he was afar off, the Father saw him and ran. God is looking for you. And you're not here by accident. You're here because God is drawing you to himself. And if you say today, I want to pray a prayer to receive forgiveness and surrender my life to Jesus, I'm going to count to three. When I say three, I just want you to lift your hand. And we are going to pray that God is going to meet you right here in this place. And when we say amen, you are going to be forgiven. And God's going to do something in your heart. He's going to make you new. And as you lift your hand, the first thing you're saying to God is you're saying, God, I know I'm a sinner, need a Savior, and I'm coming to Jesus to be saved and to be forgiven. 
one. As you lift that hand, you're saying today, I'm going to surrender to Jesus. I'm giving him all of my heart and all of my life, and I'm holding nothing back. Two. Now get ready. As you lift that hand, you're saying today, he's going to come into my heart. He's going to make me new. He's going to forgive me. I'm going to be a part of his family on my way to heaven. Three. Lift your hand up. Pray with me. I'm not right, but I want to get right. I see that hand, and I see that hand, and that hand. Are there others? Include me, Pastor. I am not right. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Someone else. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Would everybody please stand? But nobody moving, please, unless it's absolutely necessary. Now, if you, look, if you, lift, if you lifted your hand, please just look right at me. Would you please move to the aisle that's nearest you? and make your way right down here. Bring whoever you came with. Bring whatever you need. But God is going to meet us right here. Come on down. Come down. If you're in the balcony, please make your way down. We will wait for you. We're going to pray, and God is going to meet you today. And when we say amen, your past, it is going to be gone. You are going to be right with God. You're going to be on your way to heaven. Jesus said, confess me before men. He said, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. This is the greatest Father's Day present that God could ever receive. The Bible says angels are going to rejoice in heaven. Awesome. All right. No, I was standing right where you were standing 45 years ago. Seems like a long time. Come on over here. And I prayed a simple prayer. And that prayer changed my life. It's going to change your life. Right? Not just your life, but it's going to change your forever, your destiny. It was Romans 10, verse 13. It says, whosoever, that means you, and you, and you, and you, will call on the name of the Lord. We're going to call on his name the way the Bible shows us to. And this is God's promise. Will be saved. When we say amen, you are going to be saved. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to be right with God. All right, are you ready? All right. Everybody, would you take one hand, place it over your heart, lift your other hand towards heaven, and let's pray together. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm going to live for him every day. And I thank you. You have heard my prayer that I'm forgiven. My past is gone. I'm a part of your kingdom today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching and being a part of our online family. Subscribe to our channel for access to all of our videos and live services. You can also be notified when a new service becomes available if you ring the notification bell. We cannot do this without you. You can support this ministry and help us reach more people with the word by giving at reslife.org give. Thanks again for watching. Be blessed.